slave woman gives birth to a son. The boy grows up in slavery. Somehow, either from birth or from cruel mistreatment, his leg is broken and he is crippled for life. As an adolescent, he is trafficked west across Europe and sold in Rome as a slave. Finding himself in circumstances over which he has no control, he takes an unusual attitude. Don't cry about what you can't change. This attitude has made him a subject of emulation and study for nearly 2,000 years. He is Epictetus. So what I would like to do this evening is uh, tell you a little bit about his life, uh, a brief tour of some of his concepts, and then look at two people who have been influenced by Epictetus, near contemporary people, in rather unusual ways. So that's the, the plan. So let's have a look. That is Epictetus. He was born about 50 AD, we don't know exactly, about 50, 55 AD, and he lived until 135. Let's just deal with his name. I sometimes overhear people saying, how do you pronounce it? And some people say Epictetus, some people say, the Americans seem to say Epictetus. I say Epictetus because it's actually a Greek word, Epictetos, which just means acquired. So it is the kind of name you would give a slave, unfortunately. We don't know the name his mother and father gave him. What you see there, the beard, that's a symbol of the philosopher in the ancient world. And you also see there his, oops, sorry, uh, the stick, that is his left leg, which was uh, crippled. He was treated savagely en route. So he was born here in Hierapolis, in uh, what was then called Phrygia. He was trafficked across to Rome in a um, slave caravan in chains, and he was sold there uh, to a man called Epaphroditos, who was a secretary to Nero. And uh, just to refresh your memory, Nero was not one of Rome's greatest emperors. And he was busy with the executions of his half-brother, his wife, his mother, and his second wife. It wasn't a glorious period. <laughs> Finally, it came to the point where Nero had to commit suicide to avoid capture. And uh, Epaphroditus was actually involved in that period. Anyway, Epictetus himself went to Stoic lectures while he was still a slave, most notably with Musonius Rufus. And after 10 years, he achieved the status of a philosopher in his own right. Uh, he was granted his freedom by his master, Epaphroditos, and he began to teach philosophy in Rome. But in about 93 AD, the emperor Domitian expelled all the philosophers from the city, and he traveled then to uh, Nicopolis in Greece and founded his own school. And the sort of people who would have been attracted to his school would have been young men who were looking for a sort of conclusion to their education. Aristocratic young men. His most famous pupil was called Arian. Arian studied up under Epictetus when he was a young man, and he claimed to have written the famous discourses as a sort of transcript uh, taking down shorthand live from his classes. Arian describes Epictetus as being a powerful speaker who could induce his listeners to feel exactly what Epictetus wanted him to feel. So it's obviously very powerful. Many eminent figures sought conversations with him, and the Emperor Hadrian was very friendly with him and may have even visited his school in Nicopolis. So that's a tremendous thing for an emperor to go and visit the school of a philosopher. He lived a life of great simplicity, uh, with very few possessions, and he lived alone for a long time. But in his old age, he adopted the child of a friend who was orphaned, and the child would have otherwise died, and he raised this child with the aid of a woman. He was a great admirer of Socrates, and maybe in imitation of Socrates, Epictetus wrote nothing down of his own words. 
It's not to say that he couldn't write, he just didn't write down his own lectures. So Socrates is mentioned practically on every page of Epictetus' dialogues. There are two main works available, Discourses and Enchiridion. That's another Greek word meaning handbook or manual or at hand. Enchiridion is quite a short work, and if you're minded to start reading it, I would start there. So, what did he say? There's a good quote to begin with. The essence of philosophy is that a man should so live that his happiness shall depend as little as possible on external things. For Epictetus, his philosophy was a way of life. It wasn't just a theoretical discipline. Both the discourses and the Enchiridion begin by distinguishing what is in our power and what is not in our power. And here's another Greek word, prohyretic. That means will, deliberate choice, purpose, volition. We can say will. So this is very important for Epictetus. I'd just like to take a moment to explain that. So imagine you're in your car and you're going from A to B and you're on the motorway and you get stuck in traffic. The motorway is completely blocked and you are held up in that traffic for 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. Is there anything you can do about that situation? Probably not, you're just stuck in your car. Let's take another example. You have amassed a valuable collection of something, let's say stamps, and you're out one night and a burglar comes and he steals your collection. Is there anything you can do about that? You could call the police, but chances are you won't get it back. So I give these two examples just to make the point that he's saying we have to distinguish between what is in our power and what is not in our power. And there's a whole bunch of things which are not in our power. So I'm just going to make a few suggestions here. We can't really control our bodies beyond a certain point. Our health, possessions, property, glory, wealth, power, reputation, life, death, pleasure, pain, weather, economy, traffic, tube delays, and council spending. <laughs> There's quite a lot we can't control. You might say in this democratic age that we can exert a little control, and in a way we can, but when it comes down to the point where you're in the car between A and B and you're stuck in the traffic, there really isn't that much you could do. So what does that leave us with? Well, very little, but it's our own work, our opinions, our impulses, our desires, and our aversions. So this is absolutely fundamental to Epictetus. So here's a quote from Discourses. While there is only one thing we can care about and attach ourselves to, we choose instead to care about and attach ourselves to a score of others, to our bodies, to our property. And being attached to many things, we are weighed down and dragged along by them. If the weather keeps us from traveling, we sit down and fret. What should we do then? Make the best use of what is in our power and treat the rest in accordance with nature. So we seem to be subject to external events uh, which we cannot control completely. Happiness for Epictetus is not found in trying to control those things. We have to use instead our power of choice and will. So another um, quote from him which I particularly like is uh, about events having two handles. Every circumstance comes with two handles, with one of which you can hold it, while with the other conditions are insupportable. If your brother mistreats you, don't try to come to grips with it by dwelling on the wrong he's done, because that approach makes it unbearable. Remind yourself that he's your brother, that you two grew up together, then you'll find that you can bear it. It's a good image, isn't it? An event has two handles, and you can take the one handle or you can take the other handle. And that's a matter of your will and your choice. 
which handle are you going to take? It's another quote from Enchiridion. On the occasion of every event, turn to yourself and inquire what power you have for turning it to use. Well, that sounds pretty obvious. It's actually taken me a couple of years to really understand what that means. Uh, when things are going well, it's delightful. Um, when they're going badly, we long for the trouble to be over. We just wish it would go away. <clears throat> and what he's saying here is, you must take that time and make that time useful. How can you make something useful out of that time? It's a very serious philosophy. It's not just for good situations, it's also for bad. <clears throat> There's an overall aim for Epictetus of happiness. Um, the Greek word he uses is eudaimonia, which also is translated as flourishing, um, of imperturbability and good feelings. Now, the word we have now stoical tends to mean enduring, and it can mean a sort of grim enduring. Uh, this was not the case for Epictetus. He wasn't just saying, suck it up. He was saying, we must manage our reactions to external things in order to preserve our peace of mind and tranquility. It's a little more nuanced than just enduring. So why should you go to all that trouble to manage your feelings? Because then you could have peace of mind, you could have command over the emotions. And, and this is very important, these are the essential conditions for acting well in any social role. As a citizen, as a father, as a mother, as a child, whatever. These are the essential conditions for acting well. So you might wonder, oh my goodness, does that mean I'll be like a stone statue? Well, he anticipated that. He said, I ought not to be unmoved like a statue, but I should maintain my natural and acquired relationships as a dutiful man and as a son, brother, father, citizen. <clears throat> so here's the point. It's not events that disturb people. It's their judgments concerning them. This is very important for Epictetus and for people who followed him later. It's not the events that disturb people, it's their judgments concerning them. So for Epictetus, an emotion like fear or distress is, yes, it's a feeling, maybe your stomach knots up, maybe you have a sharp intake of breath, but you also have a cognition that something bad is happening and that we should avoid it. We can learn to assent to or withhold assent from that cognition. What does that mean? Is the event just neutral? Is it just our expectations that are the problem? What about an extreme event? When faced with some terrible event, such as execution or imprisonment, Epictetus said, what should we have ready at hand in a situation like this? The knowledge of what is mine and what is not mine. What I can and cannot do. I must die. But must I die bawling? I must be put in chains, but moaning and groaning too? I must be exiled, but is there anything to keep me from going with a smile, calm and self-composed? Can you believe it? <laughs> I think what you get a sense of here is his style of speaking. It's very lively. He had live students in his classes, and Arian was actually writing down what he was saying. And it's peremptory, it's professorial, it's ironical, it's very, very lively. Satirical, amused, it's very engaging. So for Epictetus, anything that is external to our will is really indifferent. We just have to exercise our will. Anything outside that really is indifferent. So you might say, well, what about health? Wouldn't we like health? Wouldn't we like wealth? Wouldn't we like a whole bunch of things? And he said, well, these are preferred indifference. They are indifferent because the will is the important thing, but it would be preferable to have health 
it's not essential. This is a stoic compromise. Health is not unimportant, but it doesn't make or break one's happiness. And uh, he also said, lameness is an impediment to the leg, not to the will. So you might wonder about an even more extreme event. What about loss and grief? And uh, here I'm going to apologize to anyone who's recently bereaved. He follows Socrates. Socrates says that uh, death is only the separation of the soul and the body. So he says, if you would have your children and your wife and your friends to live forever, you are silly. For you would have the things which are not in your power to be in your power. It's quite extreme, isn't it? Quite demanding. Never say about anything, I have lost it, but say, I have restored it. Is your child dead? It has been restored. Is your wife dead? She has been restored. It's very confrontational, isn't it? It's urging you to challenge those emotions, those reactions, um, don't just go along with them. The aim for Stoicism, it's an aim of moral improvement and it's for really a moral novice who is interested in improving himself. Um, but you're unlikely to reach the heights of Stoic sagehood. Really, how could you possibly keep up with this all the time? It would be very, very demanding. He says, it is impossible to be free from error. What is possible is to be constantly on the alert with a view to not erring. For we should be content if we avoid a few errors by never relaxing our attention to this objective. So the aim is to make efforts continuously it's not an aim to achieve. It's not aiming to achieve a certain state. It's aiming to completely and consistently make those efforts to manage those reactions. The Stoic saint is one who strives and not necessarily one who achieves. And interestingly, he advocates gentleness and tolerance towards those who err. So if someone else is less perfect, you should be gentle and tolerant with them. So the Stoic art of life is uh, not achievement, but the minute-by-minute -minute aspiration to shape oneself, irrespective of one's natural gifts, into an excellent person. <clears throat> so a word about his theology. Uh, it is warmly personal. He is not just uh, mouthing the concepts of Stoics who went before him. Uh, it is very, very sincere. For Epictetus, God, gods, Zeus, and really nature are all interchangeable terms. For him, God is everywhere, and it is a very warm personal relationship he experiences with God. A couple of points that make his theological outwork, outlook noteworthy, that, uh, as you've already heard, God gave human beings the capacity for complete autonomy, and, interestingly, that God is within. And this is a little unusual. So he said, um, Nevertheless, he has provided each of us with an individual guardian deity, a daimon in Greek, which stays by our side and is in charge of looking after us. A guardian who never sleeps and is impossible to distract. God is inside, and so is your private deity. And neither of them requires light to watch you by. Another fact about Epictetus is unusual, his attitude to equality. And given that he was uh, in Rome, it's unusual that for him, all human beings are equal in the eyes of God, whether they be male, female, black, white, slave, or free. Everybody is equal. And he recommends treating everybody well. He says, if you have been placed in a position above others, 
why are you automatically going to behave like a despot? Remember who you are and whom you govern, that they are kinsmen, brothers by nature, and fellow descendants of Zeus. So by now you should be worried about what's coming with pleasure, because it all sounds quite demanding and quite worthy. <coughs> he says we should especially be on our guard about the opinion of pleasure because of its apparent sweetness and charms. He says, remember that in life you ought to behave as at a banquet. Suppose that something is carried round and is opposite to you. Stretch out your hand and take a portion with decency. Suppose that it passes by you. Do not detain it. Suppose that it has not yet come to you. Do not send your desire forward to it, but wait till it is opposite you. So you might find that an acceptable attitude to pleasure, I don't know. Uh, you're not going to strain after it if you're a Stoic, clearly. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to just say a little bit about his position on ambition, personal ambition. Uh, you could say there isn't much place for ambition in Epictetus' works, and indeed he was a slave, so that's uh, in a way to be expected. But uh, there's a nice quote here from him about the Olympics, and we've just had the World Athletics Championships in London, so I'd just like to read you this quote about the Olympics. <coughs> you want to win at the Olympics? So do I. Who doesn't? It's a glorious achievement. But reflect on what's entailed both now and later on, before committing to it. You have to submit to discipline, maintain a strict diet, abstain from rich foods, exercise under compulsion at set times, in weather hot and cold, refrain from drinking water or wine whenever you want. In short, you have to hand yourself over to your trainer as if he were your doctor. And then there are times when you will dislocate your wrist, turn your ankle, and end up losing all the same. Consider all this, and if you still want to, then give athletics a go. If you don't pause to think, though, you'll end up doing what children do. Playing at wrestler one minute, then gladiator, then actor, then musician. And you, you're an athlete now, next to gladiator, an orator, a philosopher, but nothing with all your heart. So I think you can get the sense from that that there is a place for deciding you want to do something, but then you must really understand what it means and totally commit yourself to it. So in theory, I think you can see this was uh, described as a very demanding doctrine. Indeed, it's described as a doctrine of pitiless perfection it would be quite hard to be a good Stoic all the time. However, the interesting thing is, it actually created men of courage, of saintliness, and of goodwill. So I'd like to just mention briefly uh, Marcus Aurelius, who came a little later than Epictetus. He was a Roman emperor, and he was deeply influenced by Epictetus. His meditations are, are, are deeply stoical, <laughs> fascinating to read. So this period of stoicism, in, in particular Epictetus stoicism, led to one of the most stable periods of Roman Empire. And Gibbon, in Decline and Fall, said, from 96 AD to the death of Marcus Aurelius, so it's possibly the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government. So it led to this extraordinary period of these very, very fine governors, uh, these very fine people, actually. And Marcus Aurelius himself took the Roman Empire to the pinnacle of its power and influence. And 
The fact is an ex-slave shaped the deepest thoughts of the Roman emperor. And that is a remarkable testimony to the power and application of Epictetus' words. So much for Rome. That's quite a long time ago. That's nearly 2,000 years ago. You might wonder how anybody could actually live like this. Uh, how could you even apply this in the 20th, 21st century? That would be quite challenging. I'm going to turn now to an American. <coughs> this is James Stockdale. His full name is James Bond Stockdale. <coughs> And you can see there he was born 1923 and he died just a few years ago in 2005. He was the running mate for Ross Perot in the 1992 American election and they were running on the independent ticket. He wrote a, a short document which he actually delivered as a speech at King's College called Courage Under Fire Testing Epictetus' Doctrines in a Laboratory of Human Behavior. It's about 20 pages. You can download this from the internet and I recommend it. <clears throat> Stockdale had been in the military. He was a naval pilot. And age 38, he found himself in graduate school at Stanford in 1962. And he was studying international relations to become a strategic planner in the Pentagon. But his heart wasn't in it, he wasn't inspired, he was bored. And so one day he cruised into the philosophy department and he came across a course that was part finished, and started to become interested. And the tutor said, well, you can complete the course and in order to make up the lost time, you better come to me for private tutorials. So these two hit it off and they had a great time. And all through that time, the tutor was trying to figure out what it would be that would really capture Stockdale. What was it that he was really interested in? What was drawing him to philosophy? So on the last session, the tutor reached down from the shelf and took down a copy of Enchiridion. And Stockdale says, I'll never forget that day. And the essence of what that great man had to say was burned into my brain. Well, that was just as well <clears throat> because of what happened. Stockdale subsequently kept Epictetus and Xenophon's memorabilia of Socrates, the Iliad and the Odyssey on his bedside table, no matter which carrier he was on board from then on. He says, I was a changed man and a better man for my introduction to philosophy, and especially to Epictetus. I was on a different track. I had become a man detached, not aloof, but detached. This new built-in flexibility I had gained was to pay off later in prison. So, the, here he is, this is Stockdale. Vice Admiral Stockdale was on active duty in the regular Navy for 37 years and he was a fighter pilot on board an aircraft carrier and he was shot down on his second combat tour over North Vietnam. He was on a ship called Oriskany, which the men used to nickname Big Risk. <laughs> anyway, he was shot down. He writes, this is age 42 now. On September 9th, 1965, I flew at 500 knots right into a flak trap at treetop level in a little A4 airplane. The cockpit walls not even three feet apart, which I couldn't steer after it was on fire. Its control system shot out. After ejection, I had about 30 seconds to make my last statement in freedom before I landed in the main street of a village right ahead. And so help me, I whispered to myself, five years down there at least, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. Ready at hand from the Enchiridion as I ejected from that airplane was the understanding that a Stoic always kept separate files in his mind for A, those things that are up to him, 
and be those things that are beyond his power. So you have to picture this. He's been shot down, he's coming down with his parachute, and he's thinking in his mind, what would Epictetus say? I've got to separate in my mind, there's these two sorts of things. There's what I can control and there's what I can't control. And there's bullets from a pistol firing into his parachute as he's landing. That's a philosopher, isn't it, really? <laughs> he lands uh, well enough and he's set upon by 10 or 12 men and they beat him up very badly and they break his leg, his left leg, and he limps for the rest of his life. And uh, then somebody comes along and blows a whistle and all those people go away and he's taken off and ends up in the Hoa Lo prison, the infamous Hanoi Hilton. So he goes from being the leader of a hundred plus pilots and a thousand men and all sorts of symbolic status to being an object of contempt and known as a criminal. And he says the first thing you're aware of is your fragility because the extreme change of situation is, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Following the Korean War, the chain of command continued even in captivity for Americans. So as he's being taken to the prison, he pulls himself together because he thinks, gosh, there's gonna be other men in there and I need to be in a fit state to take command of them. And so he does. So he's age 42, on arrival he takes command of around 50 US prisoners, which in time grew to around 400 prisoners, all officers, graduates, electronic wizards, pilots. So these are bright men. Now as a senior naval prisoner of war officer in Hanoi, he was there for eight years, he was tortured 15 times, he was put in leg irons for two years, and this is the devastating thing, he was put in solitary confinement for four years. <coughs> Conventional wisdom would indicate that once you get through the initial interrogations, if you lie low, they will leave you alone. This was not the case here. There were endless interrogations. And he says the problem was not pain, it was shame. And it's a little hard to understand that, not having been in a situation like that. It's a fight of wills, even in the prison, between the Americans and the Vietnamese. And what above all you must not do, he said, is give in to shame. Pain, he said, you can manage. There are tricks for managing it, but you must not give in to shame because that's what breaks a man. They had a, a process of, um, interrogation, which I don't completely understand, but he calls taking the ropes. I think you can imagine that. The uh, arms were held behind the back, roped together, and you can just imagine the kind of positions they put people in. They were made to blurt out distasteful confessions of guilt and then put in cold soak, which was a month of total isolation, to contemplate their crimes. Now, he says what each man actually contemplated was the betrayal of himself and of everything that he stood for. <clears throat> he says, a shoulder broken, a bone in my back broken, a leg broken twice, were peanuts by comparison. Everyone came out of that experience saying, you don't want to talk to me, I'm a traitor. The thing that brings down a man is not pain, but shame. So typically a new person would be captured, they would go through this process and they would come back into the main um, area and another prisoner would say how are you and he, he'd say you don't want to talk to me you don't want to talk to me and the the man who was already with there would say listen pal there's no virgins in here snap out of it they had to fight this feeling of betrayal that they had betrayed their country and everything they stood for Stockdale himself uh, said he I whispered a chant to myself as I was marched at gunpoint to my daily interrogation. Control fear, control guilt. Control fear, control guilt. So he's finding a way of managing these feelings. This is straight out of Epictetus, as you can recognize. <coughs> Stockdale order, organized a system of communication and a cohesive set of rules that governed prisoner behavior. And these gave prisoners a sense of hope and empowerment 
and many credited these rules as giving them the strength to endure that time. Drawing largely from principles of Stoic philosophy, and in particular the Enchiridion, Stockdale's courage and decisive leadership were an inspiration to the prisoners of war. It came to spring 1969, and uh, at this point there was a climax in the struggle of wills between the Americans and the Vietnamese. And Stockdale was told he was going to be taken downtown and paraded in front of foreign journalists. And just previous to that, his wife had been campaigning for his release in America. So Stockdale slashed his scalp with a razor and beat himself in the face with a wooden stool, knowing that the captors would not display a prisoner who was disfigured. Autumn of 1969, even worse. Stockdale was caught with an outbound note that gave leads which the interrogators could develop through torture. And he knew that he could contain material as long as they didn't know it. But if they knew it, it was going to be very difficult. This would open doors leading to more people getting killed. A couple of people had already died in, as he puts it, torture overshoots. So he waddled over to his window and broke the glass and slashed his wrists with a couple of shards to demonstrate that he preferred death to submission. As it happened, a guard was passing and found Stockdale passed out in a pool of blood. And they patched up his wrists and they patched him up and put him back together. <clears throat> and eventually they put him back in the block with the other prisoners. And uh, a little later he found the little needle pointing to north, which was the indication that there was going to be a note for him left under the sink. So he found the note and he went back to his cell and on this little rag of paper written with a rat dropping was the verse, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. After that the um, treatment of the prisoners of war has changed dramatically and it improved, and this really convinced the Vietnamese of his determination to die rather than cooperate. And the torture stopped, and in every way it improved. So upon his release in 1973, his heroism was widely known about, and uh, there you see Gerald Ford presenting him with some medals. He had the Congressional Medal of Honor, two distinguished flying crosses, three distinguished service medals, four silver star medals, and two purple hearts. It was a spectacular array of honors. I read just the other day, actually, when he was uh, released, they flew him back to the States. And even when he came off the plane, he was asked to say a few words, and he talked about his Greek philosophers. It was so prominent in his mind. That was what got him through that whole time. Well, that's a very severe situation. I think we all hope we wouldn't find ourselves in that position. Um, and surely we assume we have freedom in all sorts of areas today. So I'm going to turn now to Albert Ellis, who uh, was born 1913. He died in 2007, again, just a few years ago. He was an American psychologist, and he developed rational emotive behavioral therapy. It was initially called rational emotive therapy, and he added in the behavioral therapy. Now, the point about this is it is actually the precursor to cognitive behavioral therapy, which is so widely known today. I don't think people necessarily know that Epictetus has filtered right into all of that. So um, a little bit about his life. Ellis was born to a Jewish family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was the eldest of three children, and his father was a businessman, often away from home on business trips, really showed only a modicum of affection to his children, and the same with the mother. The children really didn't get a lot from their parents. 
So he had quite a tough childhood. And um, Ellis recounts that his mother was often sleeping when the children had to go off to school. So he took responsibility for caring for his siblings. He bought an alarm clock with his own money and he got up his siblings and got them off to school and so on. When the Great Depression struck, all three children had to go out to work to support the family. Ellis himself had very poor health and he was in and out of hospital many times. And at one point he was hospitalized for nearly a year. And in that time, his mother hardly came to visit at all. And he said, rather than getting angry about that or upset about that, he distracted himself by talking to the nurses and other visitors. So Ellis says that right at the beginning, he learned to confront his adversities rather than complaining about them. He had an exaggerated fear of speaking in public and he was quite shy around women. So he set himself a task to go to the Bronx Botanical Gardens and to speak to a hundred women in sequence, not all at once. <laughs> uh, and in that whole time, he never got a date. <laughs> but he said he did desensitize himself to the fear of rejection. <laughs> quite a task, a hundred women. <laughs> he trained in psychology, especially psychoanalysis. And in 1947, he had a PhD in clinical psychology. At that point, he thought that psychoanalysis was the most effective and deepest form of therapy. But then, in 1953, he broke away from psychotherapy and he started his own therapy called Rational Therapy, then Rational Motive Therapy. Uh, and as I said, it's one of the precursors of CBT, one form of cognitive behavioral therapy. So he said, this principle, which I have inducted from many psychotherapeutic sessions with scores of patients during the last several years was originally discovered and stated by the ancient Stoic philosophers. The truths of Stoicism were perhaps best set forth by Epictetus, who in the first century AD wrote in the Enchiridion, men are disturbed not by things, but by the views which they take of them. So Ellis found and suggests that there are three core beliefs that human beings disturb themselves through. So let's just have a look at those. That's the key phrase from Epictetus, firstly. Men are disturbed not by things, but by the views which they take of them. So three core beliefs relate to, firstly, how I must perform <coughs> Secondly, how other people must treat me. And thirdly, how life must be. So let's take the first one, how I must perform. So, I absolutely must, under practically all conditions, and at all times, perform well or outstandingly well, and win the approval or complete love of significant others. But look, we're human, aren't we? It doesn't always go that perfectly. So if I fail in these important and sacred respects, that is awful. And I am a bad, incompetent, unworthy person who will probably always fail and deserves to suffer. Well, holding this belief when faced with adversity tends to contribute to feelings of anxiety, panic, depression, despair, and worthlessness. So that's the first one. So now, how other people must treat me. Other people with whom I relate or associate absolutely must, under practically all conditions and at all times, treat me nicely, considerately, and fairly. Otherwise, it is terrible, and they are rotten, bad, unworthy people who will always treat me badly and do not deserve a good life and should be severely punished for acting so abominably to me. Well, guess what? Um, people don't always treat you quite that well. So holding this belief when faced with adversity 
tends to contribute to feelings of anger, rage, fury, and vindictiveness. <coughs> so thirdly, how life must be. <coughs> the conditions under which I live absolutely must, at practically all times, be favorable, safe, hassle-free, and quickly and easily enjoyable. <coughs> And if they are not that way, it's awful and horrible and I can't bear it. I can't ever enjoy myself at all. My life is impossible and hardly worth living. So again, life doesn't always go that smoothly, does it? So when you hold that belief when faced with adversity, it tends to contribute to frustration and discomfort, intolerance, self-pity, anger, depression, and behaviors such as procrastination, avoidance, and inaction. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I have all of those problems. <laughs> At the core of these irrational beliefs, there are the explicit or implicit rigid demands and commands that are expressed by the words must, ought, should. It's recognizable. <clears throat> he said that... Um, People have these uh, emotional disturbances because of their irrational beliefs, these absolutistic musts. And secondly, no matter how or where or why they got those beliefs, um, if they're disturbed in the present, they will continue to hold those irrational beliefs and they will continue to upset themselves. And thirdly, and I think this is actually most important, Insight is not enough. It's not enough to understand what your mistakes are. You have to actually change the behavior. So you have to replace those absolute musts with more flexible preferences. REBT assumes that human thinking, emotion, and behavior are not separate processes. And when people turn their flexible preferences, desires, and wishes into these grandiose, absolutistic, fatalistic dictates, this tends to contribute to disturbance and upset. So one of the goals of REBT is to help clients see how they needlessly upset themselves and teach them how to unupset themselves, and then how to empower themselves to lead happier and more fulfilling <laughs> lives. As a system of therapy, it works best for bright individuals who have <coughs> sufficient cognitive ability to understand what's being said, and sufficient motivation to get better, to change. It doesn't work terribly well for people with learning difficulties, psychosis, autism, or people expecting miracle cures. Um, it works quite well for anxiety disorders, depression, perfectionism, anger, post-traumatic stress, addiction, aging. I might just say a word about aging. He says, quite often people who are aging say, I should be able to do what I could do before. I must look like I did when I was young. People should treat me like they always did. And guess what? They just don't. Um, also works for relationship issues, obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is probably my favorite, LFT, low frustration tolerance. <clears throat> so I think you can see there that Ellis has taken just a, a line, a concept from Epictetus, and he's created a system of therapy out of it. Um, Epictetus was not the only influence on Ellis, but it was clearly a significant one. And I think you can see from that table that it's, it's just very important. It's not the events, it's how you think about them that is upsetting. So, to conclude, we've taken a brief view of Epictetus himself and two interpretations of his hard-earned wisdom. Life doesn't always go smoothly. How do we deal with adversity? 
Do we crumple and sag, drooping down with misery? Or is there another way? Epictetus and Stockdale endured misfortunes at the extreme end of the spectrum. And hopefully we won't experience the same. But even if we do, we have heroes who've gone before and found a way through. Epictetus demonstrated through both his life and his teachings that it is possible to find freedom internally, consistently, as a matter of will, even in difficult circumstances. Epictetus is a hero to cherish in good times and especially in bad. Thank you for listening. <laughs>